friends, Heidi here from Rain Country. God is good all the time and I'm here for another this and that video and if you're new, these are weekly vlogs that I do to answer some questions that have come up recently, to give you some garden updates or to show you some projects I have going on and lead you back to some old videos on how to do it or whatever else just happens to come to mind. So let's get to the topics de jour and Today we're going to talk a little bit about nasturtiums. Now, I do have a video I did a, two or three years ago on the benefits of nasturtiums and the many ways that I use them, which just like with any of the herbs I grow, I'm always finding new ways to use them, so sometimes I'll do updates, but this is a good place to add that. And one of my things that I've been doing more often with my fresh nasturtium flowers now is making the vinegar for my hair because nasturtium flowers are very good for helping to promote hair growth and they make a very beautiful vinegar as you can see in this image right here. Now this image was combined also with marshmallow leaves and flowers and right now because of that heat wave we had my it really stunted my rose bush and so I'm not getting a lot of roses right now. I predict I'll probably in the next couple of weeks start seeing some new roses come on but it really stunted it so i'm falling back more to the nasturtium flowers which is fine because they're very beneficial to the hair and scalp and i really like throwing these dark red uh, dwarf nasturtiums in there because that is what really adds to the beautiful color of the vinegar so that's what i'm going to be doing with those today i had initially started off drying a bunch of them but then decided no I have a lot of nasturtium flowers from previous years here's an example here plus I have a couple at least a couple more jars and I don't use them up that much and there's a lot of flowers you think about a quart the nasturtium flowers dehydrate up really small so that's a lot of flowers but that's something that I'll use in when I'm doing an herb infusion for making my homemade shampoo or even for doing an oil infusion for making my hair growth oil I have videos on both of these I will go ahead and link to down below the shampoo and the hair growth oil just like I do any other vinegar when you're talking to herbal vinegar I'll just go ahead and start it right now since I'm on camera just go ahead and shove all these flowers in there like so and that's I don't go by any specific ratio I just go by sight when I'm making vinegar when I'm using fresh herbs and fruit I like to see it pretty well filled up now you got to consider something like nasturtium flowers they're gonna take up a lot of room in the jar just because there's a lot of air space in there so one can always add more flowers or whatever to it I might still go pick some marshmallow leaves to throw them in there because marshmallow is really good for conditioning the hair as well and then because there's no sugar in this or at least very little sugar I want to put in about a half cup of sugar to get this going and I have many vinegar videos in fact I just had one come out on the using dehydrated rhubarb to make vinegar but yes you can make vinegar out of any fruit vegetable or herb uh, preferably something edible because most cases you're going to be using the vinegar and something you're going to eat but even if you're not if you're cleaning countertops and stuff you still don't want it to be toxic and then I just top it off with my filtered rainwater. You can also use dechlorinated tap water and I have a video on how to dechlorinate your water. I go through many different ways that you can do it and so I'll link to that video down below. Now I a lot of times what I'll do is take a chopstick and just stir that up to get everything mixed in well get the water the flowers infusing well into the water and to also stir up that sugar however i don't worry about trying to dissolve all that sugar because it will dissolve in time as the yeast starts working off that sugar and feeding on it and then uh, turning that to alcohol which will then eventually turn to vinegar that is why at about two weeks to three weeks your vinegar will smell like alcohol because it's in the alcohol stage at that time so then you just got to give it another week to two weeks around in there for it to actually turn to vinegar yeah we'll go ahead and use an orange cloth on that one even though it's not necessary i often try to find one of my chunks of fabric that i use for vinegar that will match whatever's in the jar 
Then just put a rubber band around there to hold that in place. And the purpose of the cloth is to allow airflow. You want the gases to escape, the oxygen to get in, as you can see in many of my vinegar making videos. In fact, I'll put my most thorough vinegar making video in the description box down below because I go through a lot more in that than a lot of my other previous videos. That one's about fruit specifically, but it applies to herbs, whatever it is you're, you're turning to vinegar. So anyway, there we go. And you just want, you want to let that airflow and it takes about a month ish depending on the vinegar and where you're fermenting it and then right here i also harvested some nasturtium leaves and again that nasturtium video i'll link to down below i talk about all the uses but fresh i will eat them raw right off the plants i will add them to salads they're so good but the dehydrated ones i dry up specifically for using in my homemade antibiotic extract and I did the last time I made it, I, I tried three different herbs in the blend and made a blend using the sturtium leaves, the echinacea leaves, and the oregano leaves. So I had about equal parts. And um, I tried it. I didn't like the flavor near as much as the one I made out of just plain nasturtium leaves. Now, the effectiveness, I don't know because it's very rare we ever need something like that. But I do know the nasturtium leaf only extract does make a powerful antibiotic and it's worked very well for those I've shared it with that have needed it to clear up ear infections and so on. So I have a video specifically on how to make the that extract but just so you know I show two ways. I show one with homemade wine and one with the glycerin. However just know before you go to watch that if you don't want to use glycerin which is a common alcohol free way that people will make tinctures slash extracts but you can substitute that with honey. You can go about 50-50 honey to water. Since honey's thicker than glycerin, you can up that water amount if you want. You don't have to. You can still do three parts honey and one part water. You just want to have it uh, liquid enough that it can extract well. But honey, I've noticed when you're extracting with it, does get more watery anyway. So you don't have to lower that amount. You can keep it higher if you want. So three parts to one part, just like you would with the glycerin. And it will also make it taste better too, whatever it is you're extracting. And the honey is a natural antibiotic as well if you're using raw honey. Okay, now while we're kind of on the topic of fermenting, let's pull these forward so you can get a better look at them. This is my rhubarb wine now. So it's, what is it, about two weeks in maybe? A, a little better than two weeks. And when I started it, it was, it was about this color. Here's a picture of what it looked like when I first started it. Then after a few days, it turned very, very pale pink. So here's a picture of what it looked like in the last time I showed it in a video. And I wasn't sure, I thought maybe it would stay the pale pink, but I had a feeling it might go back to the darker color because I've seen this happen before. And surely enough, it did go back to the darker color of the rhubarb. Now, this one, you might see a slight variance in color because this one has some of my red currants in it as well. So it's just got a little bit deeper of a red color. Now, even though that has a ways to go before it's ready, it's got a... a I know it's been over two weeks. I don't really keep track anymore in my calendar. I just watch it and then I'll taste it along the way and test it and see where it's at. Well, it's interesting. Now, here's the thing is that the when I got this started, I also had some extra rhubarb juice left from juicing it. And yes, I'll still do a video on this. I just want to wait till it's all finished before I do. So the extra juice, I went ahead and added some fermentation starter out it and just made a rhubarb soda out of it and add a little sugar to it because it's still going to work through the sugars and rhubarb doesn't have any sugar in it. It's very, very tart. And while it was good, the taste was very different than what I expected. I mean, even the juice without fermentation starter or anything added to it almost had a salty flavor. And I thought that was interesting because I've eaten raw rhubarb right off the plant and didn't notice it having any kind of flavor of sodium in it. But once it's been juiced, it just has this little bit of saltiness to it. So I'm not sure what the wine's going to turn out like, but tasting it along the way and, and drinking that soda, what I figure if it's going to be a, a, a wine that you're not going to use for, you know, sautéing and stuff like I do a lot of so sautéing with my homemade wine and marinating as well, this would be great for either one of those. But if you decided you want to drink it and yours kind of has the same sort of flavor, I think maybe adding a little splash of lime juice to it 
and then put it in a salted glass. If you like margaritas, I think it would be a great tequila replacement in a margarita. At least I think it would. I haven't tried it, so I don't know. Maybe when it's all done, I'll just do a little taste test and see, and I'll let you know what I think when I go to do that video on the rhubarb wine and how to make it. And of course, I do have a full playlist on how to make wine out of pretty much any fruit that I will go ahead and put down below. It also, in that playlist, also has a video on how to make homemade flavored mead. The difference between mead and wine is mead is made from honey, where wine is made from juice. So, and then you can add flavors to your mead, add fruit in there to give it a flavor if you want, which is what I've always done. Okay, so moving on to uh, another random topic. Now, you might remember, I think it was my last this in that video, I mentioned these little pots and how I found out that these are really great for using in my solar oven. I Even though I use the enamelware ones that came with my solar oven, and mine's the Solarvore, they don't make it anymore. If you're gonna purchase a solar oven, I do recommend the All American Sun Oven, which I do have an affiliate link for, even though I personally don't have one yet. I'll go ahead and put the link to that below if you'd like to check it out. But I've been using a solar oven for many years, and, and the one that we got did come with the two enamelware pans, which are perfect because they're black. So whenever you're baking in a solar oven, using something that's dark, a pan that's dark but not too thick, and I was a little concerned because these are a little on the thicker side. They're thicker than the enamelware pans. But when I started using them in the solar oven, I found out they work just as good, if not better. And I love this size. Now, initially I had found two of them at a garage sale for 50 cents a piece and it looked like they'd never been used. And I thought they were pretty cute and I wasn't sure. I was kind of debating because it's like, I don't know how much I'd use something that small. Well, it's just me and Patrick now and I don't usually eat dinner. So the, this is like the perfect size, but even for two people, depending on what you're putting in here, this can be the perfect size for two people. And since I only had the two, I was like, man, I'd really like to find at least one more so I can have like maybe potatoes in one, carrots or beans or something in the other, and then a main dish in the other one. And that would be perfect. Well, they just don't make them anymore. So I had to go to eBay to find them. This is called Megaware and it, it was made in Spain. But anyway, I love these. The two colors I've seen are the dark green and then kind of a cream color. Anyway, they stack really nicely if you just invert the lids. And so it works out really good. And, and anyway, I ended up with two more instead of just one more because that was a, I found a, the best price I could get on eBay was getting two instead of just getting one. And I'm like, well, I can still fit all four of them in my solar oven at one time. In fact, the other day I baked... I made two dinners at once because I like to get as much stuff done before the days I have to watch the baby. So Pat has plenty of meals to get him through the, the that three days. And so I had three pots in there with, uh, let's see, I was baking fish in one, potatoes in the other, and then I had a vegetable in the third one. And then I had one of the bigger enamelware pans that I had put a, a chicken veggie bake in, and that was, a, so that was a one dish meal. And I actually managed to fit all four of those pans in the solar oven and just let everything bake all day. And it's great when you got a lot of sun coming, you don't have to heat up the inside of your house on a hot day, you can use your solar oven. I do recommend getting one. It, they really are nice to have. And some of you people could probably use it year round. We can't do that here because we don't get a lot of sun. We have about nine months of clouds. That might be a bit of an exaggeration, but it's pretty close. This might sound kind of silly, but I wanted to bring this up is that um, I got this barber brush because um, I do cut my family's hair. My boys are, well, Ryan actually started cutting his own hair, but Justin still comes over here to get haircuts. I cut Pat's hair. So I found out a barber brush works really good for dusting out your keyboards. Now, obviously blowing them out every so often is really good, but in between, using a barber brush is perfect for just dusting it out and kind of getting in between the, the keys on your keyboard. So I got this one just for keeping in my little workstation that some of you might have watched the video on. I'll go ahead and put that down below. It came out last week. But yeah, I keep this handy and then when my keyboard starts getting full of whatever, I just dust it off. It works really good for that. So I just thought I'd bring that up as just, you know, a little uh, repurposing thing. But that's the only reason I bought that barber brush was for that. I have another one for a haircut. And then one more thing, I, I gotta come back to the vinegar. I meant to talk about this while I was talking about vinegar. So I get, every time I put a vinegar related video out, 
almost every video somebody will ask me have you ever made balsamic vinegar well no i haven't and it's doubtful especially if you live here in the united states you will either <laughs> you can make a mimic of balsamic vinegar and you can look that up and find a way to do that but true balsamic vinegar is made from two varieties of grapes that are only found in Italy. At least last I looked, they're only found in Italy. I'll put the names right here so you can look them up. And the other thing to get true balsamic vinegar is that it needs to be done in wooden barrels. They can be oak, chestnut, cherry, even juniper. And they need it needs to age for a very minimum of 12 years. So when you're buying true balsamic vinegar, you're going to find it labeled in certain ways. If it has a red label on it, that means it's been aged for 12 years. If it has a silver label, then it's been aged for 18 years. And if it's aged for 25 years, that means it's earned the gold label. And so that's why you'll also see varying prices. If you're finding a balsamic vinegar where you're buying a gallon of it for maybe $20, $30, that's actually not true balsamic vinegar. It's basically a mimic. And there are ways that they do that to get the similar flavor, but, and you could possibly do the same thing. A lot of them are only aged for as little as two months rather than 12 years. But if you're wanting a true balsamic vinegar, there's a lot more involved in it than just throwing a bunch of stuff in a jar with some water and sugar. The other thing I forgot to say is it's also condensed down. So in the process of this 12 year at least process, it goes from one size barrel down to another size barrel down to another size because as the water is evaporating out, that's what condenses it down and that's how you get that very strong flavor in your balsamic vinegar. And if I'm understanding correctly, thanks to one of my followers, some of that flavor is also coming from the tannins that are in the wooden barrels that the vinegar is aged in. So anyway, just so you know, no, I've never made balsamic vinegar and I probably never will. And I don't think I'm patient enough to age something for 12 years, even if I could find those grapes. All right, well, that's it for my this and that video for the week. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Take care and God bless.